to say amen and go home. <laughs> Praise the Lord, I love that. My voice was just a wee bit better, I'd really sing it. <clears throat> but I figured if I sing any louder, y'all might run out. <laughs> Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Another glorious day that he's allowed by his grace and by his mercy and has blessed every aspect of our lives. We are always going, many times going through something. And I saw uh, Brother Ali and he came in and when his eyes was half closed, huh? I didn't know what was going on. I thought maybe uh, he, he said something wrong and the missus had to get with him. But he assured me that that was not going on. He had had some surgery and... And so the man is healing, and we'll keep him in prayer in regard to what the Lord is doing with him. And guys, there's always something going on in our lives. And I love the fact that we serve a risen Savior, and he knows all about it. In fact, he allows what he allows in our lives and has already worked out the fix. And we are simply to be obedient to him and do what he calls us to do and leave the heavy lifting, which is our healing, leave that up to him. Amen? Amen. As, as you see in your bulletin, we're back in our study in this great book of Hebrews. And by way of review, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10, and I'll begin my reading at verse 32. Hebrews 10, thank you, Lord. And begin my reading at verse 32. As, as the Hebrew writer is talking to these uh, Hebrews and, and speaking to them, many of them were trying to uh, uh, make this better in Christ and make that better in Christ. In other words, they were trying to look back. They were trying to go back and he's encouraging them and encouraging us as well that Christ is the only way. In verse 32, if you with me, say amen. amen. He says here, but call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, he says you endure a great flight or fight of affliction. And what he's saying is that, look, they were getting close to the believers. They were hanging out with the believers. They were fellowshipping with the believers. And they were also close. And because of that, because they were with them and fellowshipping with them, they, they were going through much of what the believers were going through as well. It says in verse 33, partly while, uh, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became, it says, companions of them that were so used. In other words, man, they saw this Christianity thing as a good thing. God was wooing them in. They were hanging out and fellowshipping with the believers. And because of that, look, the, the unbelievers, they, they linked them along with everybody else. And they were going through some things as well. In verse 34, it says, For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven, look, a better place and an enduring substance. And he's letting them know that, look, you came to me. In fact, a lot of people use this verse in, as, as uh, making Paul the, uh, the, the, the writer of this when they said that you had compassion to me in my bonds. But guys, back in that, those times, a lot of believers were getting arrested. So it could be Paul. Doesn't necessarily have to be Paul. Amen. But he says, again, verse 34, uh, Mr. Rick, do you have a bulletin? Well, make sure you get one. For ye had compassion of me and my bonds. Ye took joyful in the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourself that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. In other words, you were going through for Christ's sake, and, and a lot of times you didn't even know what was going on. Verse 35, he says, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which had great recompense of reward. In, in other words, man, you guys have been hanging out with the believers. You, you've been walking with us and, and, and learning from us. And, and he said that, look, you might as well go all the way and, and bless and ask Jesus into your heart for yourself. And don't fall away. Don't go back to the old, regardless of what you're going through, because God still has you. He says in verse 35, cast not away, therefore, your confidence which has great recompense of reward. In, in other words, eternal rewards in Christ Jesus. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. And by the way, guys, that's the hope of all believers. 
They, they are folk in this world. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And, and, and we got all these the, the folk coming into the country. We got the open borders. We got folk are doing whatever they want to do. And the government is trying to say it's okay. We're trying to... Uh, uh, look back and, and how it used to be and we know it's not that way anymore. We, we got houses being built all around us. We, we got folk in, 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 in fluxing here into our town and our state at, at an alarming rate. More traffic than we've ever seen. Uh, uh, your dollar sure is not going as far as it used to. And we sit back and we look with an election looming and we figure, try to figure out this whole thing and, and which way it's going to go. And, and what the writer is saying is that don't watch so much what What's going on around you but keep your eyes on Christ because that's what you need is the promise that he has promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you that he's got you even in the midst of changing times and we have some changing times in our times he says in verse 37 for yet a little while and he that shall come will come and he will not tarry and look, he, what he's saying is that Christ always keeps his promises. And though we can't date and say when it's going to happen, he said he's coming back. He says he's taking us out. He says he's going to straighten out sin and sinner. And he's going to do it. He's going to keep that promise. In verse 38, he says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. And what he's saying is that guys, there's no time to be going back and looking back and, and thinking about even with Israel and how they had the leeks and onions when they were in Egypt. And we can go back to the old covenant and, and do the things that we're doing. But they're in revisionist history. They forget just how rough and wicked it is. And, and by the way, or was. And by the way, even with us, sometimes we think it was better prior to salvation. And, and let me tell you, give you a little tidbit of, of truth. It was not. It just appeared to be, and we never remember the rough times as well as we remember the good times. He said, but ye are not of them who draw back under perdition. And I love that word, man. He, he, perdition, simply put it, it, it means eternal damnation. He's saying that we're not those guys. We, we don't draw back. We don't go back to sin. We are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe, he says, to the saving of the soul. And, and listen, what we know is, uh, uh, this, uh, in fact, there's, I won't, won't go there, but there's a verse in in the Gospel of Luke not chapter 9, verse 62, and it said, No man, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And, and listen, what Luke was saying in, in his book, in that Gospel, what Christ was saying in that Gospel, is that God has brought you somewhere, he's taking you somewhere, and he's not done with you yet. Don't act like you're not in him if you're in him. And don't even think about going back there. And, and guys, sometimes even we in our minds, we can think back in our minds. And we can go places. And, and we see those things as more pleasant than they are now. But God has you here. And, and by the way, I'm 73. I'm not going to ask you to tell me how old you are. But, but I'm 73, and, and, and what I know is that I'm never going to be 72 again. So as he moves me, as he progresses me, as he blesses me even in this time of my life and has given me some wisdom that I, before I did not have, I don't need to try to go back to when I was 53 and acting like a or 43 and acting like a fool. I need to move and progress forward because uh, he's blessed me to learn some things, to see some things, to grow into some things, and listen, even to go through some things, and much of that I don't want to go through anymore and he has me here and now to be a blessing and also to be blessed in the place where he has me now and, and look at my hands to the plow God's got me doing his work I don't need to look back because if I do that the roads that I'm hoeing are going to be crooked just keep my eye on the prize keep going where God has called me to go and forget about yesterday forget about the day before that because I can't do anything about it but I can do something about today and I can live it to the fullest as God has blessed me in this day and I can move onward and upward in Christ Jesus.
And the Hebrew writer says in verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back under perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And that is my belief. And my prayer is I hope that that is your belief, that God has got you and he's working something out in you. And, and the fact that as we get older, we're not able really to physically sometimes do what we used to do, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because now when I want to do something and my body won't let me, I've got to rely on the one who can do something, and that's my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And by the way, that's where he wants me, relying wholly and solely on him. Guys, please be prayerful with me as I continue in this sermon series. Christ alone is worthy. And Father, as we dive deeper into chapter 11 of this great book, I pray, Father God, that you hide me behind your cross. And Father God, bless what I'm going to say to be words that you have had me study for this particular congregation, dear Lord. Uh, allow me to preach not with my power, but with yours. And Lord, may my words be filled, Holy Ghost filled, so that as they reach all of us, Lord, they'll be placed in the place where they would do it most good for understanding, for wisdom, Father God, for growth, and for surely instruction. As I pray in Jesus' name and for his name's sake, amen. amen and amen. As we move into chapter 11 of this great book, uh, many call this the Hall of Fame of Faith and begins to speak about some of the old covenant saints that did what they did, not even being indwelt with the Holy Spirit. They did what they did by believing God. What a remarkable thing to do. He says in verse 1 of chapter 11, Now faith, and he's talking about that belief, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I love how the writer, he's speaking about this thing called faith, but he's speaking about it as in something tangible, because in reality, it really is. We can't perhaps hold it in our hands like I can with this, this, this uh, uh, little handkerchief thing here, but, but it's, still, it's still tangible, spiritually tangible just as well. He says in verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and we hope for many things, eternal things, that have not been realized yet, but they're still real because it's faith in my heart. It says the evidence of things not seen, and look, I can tell you about it, and I can tell you 100% without any kind of backing off that when I die, I'm going to heaven. And you say, Brother Ralph, prove it to me. All I can do is show you what Scripture says because of who I know and whose I am that when I leave here before I keel over and hit the floor, he says I'll be with him. And because, and look, that's to me is tangible. And that's real. And I'm not backing off of that. And I'm not trying to go back to something I don't know. I'm talking about what the writer is talking about and it is real. He says in verse 1 of chapter 11, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And listen, even though I don't quite have it yet, I do have it because God promised and everything he promises is yea and amen. He goes on as he continues to talk about this faith. He says, For by it the elders obtained a good report. In other words, guys, they were believing God, I don't care what. Some, come something hellish or high water, I'm going to believe God. And because of that, they obtain a good report from God. Through faith, we understand, verse 3, that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And listen, when you read that, man, and, and for some it might sound like it's convoluted, but what I know is that there was one day there was nothing, and God spoke to nothing and said, you got to become the heaven and the earth, and nothing had, had to obey and became the heaven and earth. Nobody was there. By the way, uh, Moses wrote the book. He wasn't there, but God gave him every single little word, every dot, every tittle to write. And, and by faith, guys, I believe that. 
And you get folk that, that want to say, oh, some primordial ooze that came up out of, came out, out of, from out of where? There was nothing. But God said heaven and earth. And heaven and earth appeared. And, and by the way, that's creation. And nobody's creating anything except for God. We can take something and you hear it on commercials. It's new and improved and we made it better. But they all have to take something that's already here with the exception of the Godhead. They said heaven and earth and bam, there it was. Now whether or not it was a big bang, I don't know. I simply know God said it and that settles it. And by faith, I'm believing that. He says in verse 3, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God and so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And, and listen, Genesis 1 and 1, that's my hope, that's my faith. I'm believing on what God says. In verse 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And, and listen, what we talk, he's talking about uh, Adam and Eve's sons. One was Abel. One was Cain, and, and this and this said that Abel offered a more sexual, a more satisfactory sacrifice than Cain. This is by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testified of his gifts, and by it it says, uh, "He being dead yet speaking." And, and look, look what, what we know is that of these two brothers, that though they came from the same parents, real close in age. What we know is that one had a bent toward wickedness or, or selfishness, and one had a bent toward the things of God. And, and what we know, I, I, we don't know exactly what it is that they gave. We, we know that Cain was a, a, a tiller of the ground. And, and listen, in his mind, and we see that even today, guys, that God asked us for a specific thing. We talked about it last week that, that, that he would not have us the, the forsaking of ourselves together as some are that, that we ought to be in church. And, and, and sometimes man will say, well, you know what? I'm not going to go to church all the time. But, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to double up on my offering. I'm going to give some money, more money I gave before. And, and though I'm not there, my money will, will replace that. And, and, and listen, what we know is, is, in fact, there's a verse in, in 1 Samuel 15 and 22, and, and it says to obey is better than sacrifice. And, and by the way, just like Cain, we don't give God what we want to give him. We give him what he requires. And if I never gave a dime to this ministry or none other, but I give myself to him, man, God's going to be pleased. And he'll use me and do with me as he sees fit. And will take and, 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 and bless me and, and, and direct even my giving because I'm giving myself to him. He Look, as much as, 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 as ministries and, and, and different places that we support, they need our support, they need our financial support. Guess what? If we simply pray for them, God's going to bless them just as much and maybe sometimes even more than what they can do with our dollars and cents. Because he, in reality, owns everything. I'm talking about the Lord now. And he really does not need our substance. But man, he really would like to have you. And for all the folk that are talking about they love him, and, and, and listen, they, they, they've been saved by him, and, and they also love him so much. And, and look, if I love him so much, then I need to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, thank you for the night. What would you have me to do today? Use me. Is there someone you need me to pray for? Is there someone I, I, I need to call? Maybe I need to go and, and give somebody a helping hand. Maybe there's something that you need me to do. I need to give myself an offering just like his son did. And he's not even requiring us to put ourselves in, in, on, the, on the cross. Christ already did that. But if I know him and love him and in reality want to be used by him, that I'm going to give myself to him. And everything else is going to work itself out. He goes on, he's, in fact, he says again in verse 3, through faith we understand that the world were framed by the word of God so that things were seen were not made of things which do appear. 
By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. And by the way, it was more excellent than his brother's Cain because it was what God required. And look, from the earthly, maybe Cain's looked better. Maybe it was more abundant. But that was not what God required. I can't make anything that if God wants it and he asks for a specific thing. I can't make what he's asking for better. The best I can do is give him what he requires. If he needs me or my time or my talents or whatever it is, I need to give that to him. Because he can take what I give to him freely and he can make it what he would have it to be. But if I make up in my mind, and in essence what Cain says, he says the same thing that many times men and women say. Yeah, I know he's asking for this, but I think it's better if I give him this. And we have blown it already. Amen. He says again, verse 4, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by the which he obtained a witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, it said, being dead, yet speaking. And, and listen, by the way, both of them are speaking, one on, on, the, on the, the blessing side, and one showing us how it should not be done. Verse 5 says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found, in other words, no remnant, no, no part or parcel of him is said because, uh, uh, because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And listen, that's the testimony you want to have. Man, one that pleases God. No, Brother Ralph didn't get the most money. Brother Ralph didn't, 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 didn't uh, uh, go and, 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 and go on a mission field in, in the deepest, darkest Africa. But he did what God required of him. And because of that, he pleased God. That's the testimony you want. Amen. And look, because of that, Enoch, who walked with God, got so close to God, and was walking with him, and then all of a sudden he was no more. He didn't die. He translated him right into heaven. Very few and far between that happens. But man, I want to get so close to God, man, that 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 man. But by the time it's ready for me to leave here, that you can't even tell where 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 I begin and, and where the Lord ends, because I'm walking close with Him and I'm gonna hold on to Him. And when sin encroaches and tries to get me out the track, I'm pushing sin aside and I'm gonna grab hold of my Lord even that much more, because what I know is that I can do all things through Him, because He strengthens me. But when I let him go and I start to waver my own way, what I know is that without him, I can do nothing. And I need him every day. I, I, I need him every morning. I, I need him every hour because I can't even brush my teeth without the Lord because I have my very being. And by the way, you have your very being because of him. That he gives you your strength. He, he gives you your wits and your mind. He, he, he gives you your, your, your ability to be able to do this and that. And even super empowers it as we get closer and closer to him. Verse 5 says, by faith. And again, holding on to belief in God is what he's talking about. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because he, had because he had translated him. And before, before his translation, he had this testimony. He pleased God. He goes on in verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. And, and by the way, guys, the writer is not saying it's hard to please him without faith. He's not saying it might get a little difficult to please him. He says without faith. In other words, if you don't believe him, and in fact, let me let him say it. He says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In other words, man, I can't do anything by faith without even knowing who I'm having faith in. 
that just came in and, and you sat in those chairs. You, you had faith in the chair. Do you believe because you had a history that the chair held you up before? Guess what? Christ has held you up all your life and has blessed you to come to this point of your life. And you can trust him with every aspect of your life. And you can go on with Christ because you have a history that he has blessed you. In fact, he woke you up this morning and started you on your way. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Man, man, sometimes I, I, I think about my wife and I, we just, just two simple believers and who love the Lord and we try to serve him as best we can. And, and I look at our lives and, 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 and though we don't have much, what he does with us, it, to us is like a, a million. Because he takes care of us, so he, he takes care of our health, he, he takes care of our finances, he, he takes care of our family, he takes care of us. And it literally blows our mind how he does what he does to us. Here, just mere mortals. And the only difference between us and an unbeliever is that we love the Lord. And, and we don't just say it. It shows in the way that we live. And he grows us and blesses us and, and blesses us even more. And, and we also want to get closer and closer and closer to him. But everything we do in regard to our Lord, we do it by faith. Guys, if you would, block that page off. Just put your bulletin in that page and go with me to the book of James, chapter 1. That should be page 1051 if you're using a, a pew Bible. James, chapter 1. Again, we're talking about faith. And it should be page 1051 and chapter 1, verse 1. When you're there, please say amen. And James writes here, he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, James says, greeting. And listen, just in this one verse, first of all, he, he doesn't, he doesn't talk, call himself uh, Jesus' half-brother. I was raised with him. Now, he calls himself a servant of God. By the way, all his earthly brothers, they were un, unsaved until Christ was risen. And then ultimately and finally, they came to faith in him. He said, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, and he said, greeting. And what we know, the 12 tribes of, of Israel, they were scattered. And, and we know when, when, when the Holy Spirit came and, and they were blessing and ministry and they would come to faith in Jesus. And, and they were in Jerusalem having a, ho a, a hallelujah good time. But, but they weren't really trying to go nowhere. They weren't trying to fulfill the Great Commission that they were to go all over and tell folk about Christ. And, and so the Lord used persecution and other means to have them scattered and as they scattered uh, they told people about Christ and they were thereby fulfilling the great commission. Verse 2 says my brethren count it all joy when and we'll pause there for a minute because what James is saying is that it's going to happen there's going to be some times in your life it's not going to always be up there's going to be some down times. There's going to be some times when the Lord allows things into your life. But it's not to destroy you. In fact, I'll let James continue. My brethren, verse 2, count it all joy when, he says, you fall into diverse temptations. And listen, he's talking about various kinds of trials that's going to come your way. And listen, if you could, no, we don't do it. If you could just live obedient for the rest of your years until you leave here, there are still going to be some things that God is going to allow your way because he wants to grow you, he wants to bless you, he wants to minister to you, and wants you to have to go through some things that you can't fix so that you can rely wholly and solely on him. And he says here in this verse that we're counting our joy. And what we know is that the joy of the Lord, that's really our strength. 
that when I'm going through in the midst of it, man, I can get closer to the Lord. I can pray to him. I can talk to him. And by his spirit, he can well me up and let me know that, brother, Brown, look, you've gone through. And, and listen, whenever this thing is over, I'm, a, I'm not going to let you stay here forever. But in the midst of that hurricane that's swirling all around you, stay close to me and everything is going to somehow be okay. I'm recalling Paul the Apostle when they, they were taken in from one place to another. They were on the ship and, and, and the guards were panicking and everybody on the ship was panicking and the ship is falling apart and God had already told Paul that you're going to get to your destination and if all of you and everybody else stay on that ship everything is going to be okay. Guys, it might look rocky, it might look rough but God says, hold on to him and stay on that ship because that's safety on that ship. He says in verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, many kind of trials. He said, knowing this, and so James wants us to know something, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And, and by the way, we claim that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But if we never go through anything and had to count on or allow us to get closer to the Lord or call on the Lord for help, if we never went through anything, how could we actually ever know that he is able? And so he allows us to go through some things because personally he wants you to know he's able. And that he can fix it. And, and that there's nothing too hard for him. And, and look, he, so he allows it. And your trials might not be the same as my trials. And mine might not be the same as yours. But we are all, he says, when are going to go through some things. And I dare say right now, somebody in here or everybody in here is going through something. But God said, don't rely on your own intellect. Rely on me. He says in verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And there's that word again speaking about patience, uh, uh, faith. He says, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. There was a, 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 a couple who had a little child. And, and that was their first child, and they just wanted to pamper this baby. And so if the baby just act like he was going to cry, just go, <coughs> here they go running, picking him up. Oh, you're going to be okay, sweetheart. And, and then an old fellow told him one time, he said, um, you might want to let the child just cry for a few, a little bit. Act like he, he's going to go through something. Before he can go through anything, you are not allowing him to experience what it is God would have him to experience. And that's what God does with us that we go through things, but the whole time he's got us. And like that little baby, the parent ain't gonna let him go through too much because the Lord is gonna snatch you up and take care of you as well. But in his time, the verse four says, but let patience have our perfect work that you may be perfect and entire and wanting nothing. And, and listen, he's not talking about sin and his perfection, but what he is, is saying is that when these trials come into your life, that there's something that you're supposed to get out of it. And, and listen, if you can pull yourself out with your finances or whatever, you haven't gotten it. And, and by the way, if he's allowed it once and he wants you to get something out of it, you're going to learn what he's trying to teach you. And many times we use our resources to try to short circuit those trials. But man, when God throws you in something or allows something in your life, he does it for a reason and for a purpose. We need to get what it is he's trying to show us. Because guess what? It's going to come back out. It's going to come back up because he's trying to teach you something in the midst of what you're going through. He says in verse 4, but let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. 
In verse 5, he says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. And, and he's not talking about worldly wisdom in verse 5. He's talking about godly wisdom. And there are times when we're going through or times when something happens and we don't understand. And, and, and listen, a lot of folk will ask me questions and I give them what I got. And generally what I got is going to come from God's word. Because we need to go to the Lord. Because some of us are going through some things that the Lord has allowed for his purposes and only he has the answer or the key as to why you're going through. Maybe you're selfish. Maybe he's teaching you not to be selfish. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're self-centered. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're, you're, you're leaning on some fleshly desire or sin and he's trying to show you what you're going through. Maybe you're, you're not relying on the Lord enough and he's trying to teach you, you're not coming out of this. I'm not letting you get to work your way out of this one. You're going to have to wait on me and whatever it is, we need to hold on to him and get closer to him. And, and by the way, ultimately, that's what he wants for all of us is to get closer and closer to him, especially in the times that we're living right now. Guys, the world don't have no answers for this mess we see, and much of it is the cause of it is sin, and we know this, the sin bearer, the one who has blessed us, has blessed us to forgive us our sin, so we ought to get closer to him and ask him, he says, and what we are asking, guys, by the way, verse 6, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. In other words, we're believing even before we ask God that he's going to work this thing out or give us the information we need. He says, for he that wavereth is like a wave of sea driven with the wind and tossed. And, and look, you go out to the ocean, we live right close to it, and you see the waves go up, and they go down, and they go up, and they go down, and then they come into shore and they dissipate. And that whole thing starts all over again. And, and in reality, they're not going anywhere, but you can watch the motion of them all day long. He says, in verse, and by the way, he said, let them ask in faith. In other words, there's that word again. He's talking about believing even before we ask that God is going to work it out. He says, for uh, verse 7, for let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. And then he hits us between the eyes in verse 8. And he says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And, and look, what James is saying is that he's again talking about faith. The same faith that we saw in the book of Hebrews. He's saying that either we believe God or we don't. We don't pick and choose when to believe in. If I'm in a pickle and going through something, I need to go to the Lord. And listen, I, I can't say, well, yeah, I went to the Lord before. This time I'm going to go to my banker, or, or, or this time I'm going to go to my cousin, or, or, or this time I'm going to try to buy my way out, or this time I'm going to try to work my way out, or, or, or this time I'm going to try to do something else to get out of this pickle. Either it's Christ and he alone at all times, or it's not. And if we're not there, where it's always Christ, then we're double-minded. And what he is saying is that I'm going to be unstable, not just in my prayer life, not just in my church attending life, but I'm going to be unstable in the midst of everybody. And in reality, I can't be trusted because I don't truly believe God is the answer. I do a little ministry at, at, at a place called CITA, C-I-T-A. It's called Christ is the answer. And, and, and they have that on their billboard in the back of the, their little uh, fellowship hall, their worship hall. And I remind those guys of that all the time, that Christ really is the answer. They're not just letters up on the wall that I don't care what you're going through, how you're going through, how rough it is, how bad it is, how long you've been going through. I don't care what Tom said. I don't care what Harry said. I don't care what Dick said. That Christ is the answer and we need to be sold out for his cause in every aspect of our lives. And if we don't believe that, then we need to go back to our first works and tell the Lord that somehow I thought I believed. 
But I think, Lord, you need to help my unbelief because I'm not quite there yet. Amen. Flip back to Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse 6 as we close out. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. But he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that's first, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You got to believe that. Can't just believe it today and next week be off on some other tangent. Christ is the answer. And he is good for what ails us. No matter what that might be. And I got to believe that. Because guys, I have already proclaimed that he is my only hope. And if he's not my answer, then I'm doomed already. But in my heart of hearts, because of my track record with him, I already know he is my answer. And my prayer is that you know he's the answer for you. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for this time of study in which we can look through some verses of Scripture in Hebrews and in James and, Father God, even reference others. And Father God, just, just knowing, uh, Lord, our sermon series that Christ alone is worthy and only you are worthy. And Father God, we're living in a time when folk are, are, are grasp, grasping and grabbing a hold of all kinds of things. And they're trying to make that work or, or, or fix their lives. But Lord, only you can fix anything. As you are the author and finisher of our faith. Help us to know that, Father God. And if need be, take us to a place where you'll convince us and convict us. And Father God can take us to the place of salvation if need be. We thank you. We praise you, Father God. Please be mindful of our prayer list. Remembering Brother Alion and, and the issue with his eye. You even know the ins and outs, Father God. Bless and, and, and allow that to go according to your plan. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We say yes to your will and to your way. As we pray in Jesus' name and for his name's sake. And let God's church say amen. amen. And amen. God bless you guys and thank you.